Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of the world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is God's word to us this morning. Let's ask him for his blessing as we uh, look at his word this morning. Father, we thank you that you do speak to us. We thank you that you have revealed yourself in the Bible, that you have shown us who you are, that you have shown us your plan to redeem all things to you. Lord, we thank you for this passage in front of us as well. And as we consider what it has to say to us, Lord, give us open hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be at work among us, Lord, that you would be uh, enlightening our minds and our hearts to hear your word, uh, to receive this word, to be changed by this word. Lord, guide us and help us. Give us all that we need uh, this morning. Guide my words. Uh, give me all that I stand in need of in speaking as well. We pray that you would be glorified in this time together. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start off by reading a short book. It's called The Holy Spirit. Triune. There are three equal persons in the one eternal God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Regeneration. All people have sinned and chosen to disobey God. The Holy Spirit gives people new hearts so they can see God clearly and respond to him in worship. Pentecost. After Jesus rose from the grave, he sent the Holy Spirit as a gift to the church at Pentecost. Indwelling. The Holy Spirit lives with God's people, helping us to walk in a manner worthy of God. Conviction. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see how bad our sin is, helping us to turn away from our rebellion and obey God instead. Sanctification. Believers become more like Jesus every day through the help of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. Special gifts are given to believers, which are used to speak truth and serve the church. Fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps believers to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Guide. The Holy Spirit leads believers in truth so they can know the difference between right and wrong. Perseverance. Those who are saved by God are kept until the last day by the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. No, there's a little more. But it is a very helpful summary of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
has been called the forgotten person of the Trinity, someone we just don't talk a whole lot about. And although I think saying he's the forgotten person of the Trinity is a little bit of an overstatement, I do think he's, he's the person of the Trinity that we don't focus enough on. And as, as we can see from a children's book on the Holy Spirit, there's so much that we can talk about. There's a rich theology of the Holy Spirit just in uh, thinking about this topic for today and, and looking around. It's interesting that theologians in the past have written volumes on the Holy Spirit. John Owen, who was a, a British theologian in the 1600s, wrote three volumes just on the Holy Spirit. And that's not including other books and things he wrote on the Trinity. So who is the Holy Spirit? What does he do? There's so much that could be said. One sermon is very limited in what you can do. But I do want to, as we look at John chapter 16, pull out a number of aspects of the Holy Spirit's work to help us just begin to understand who he is, what he does, how he's alive and active in our world today. And so as, as we work through a John 16, three things that we want to see together in connection to the work of the Holy Spirit. First, that the Holy Spirit furthers Jesus' ministry. Second, that he applies Jesus' ministry. And thirdly, that he reveals Jesus' ministry. The Holy Spirit furthers Jesus' ministry, applies Jesus' ministry, and reveals Jesus' ministry. First of all, the Holy Spirit furthers Jesus' ministry. I want for us to a mo for a moment to, to place ourselves in this passage. We need, in order to understand what's happening, we need to understand where this comes in the Gospel of John. John 13 through 17 is a section of John's Gospel that's known as the Upper Room Discourse. Uh, it includes the passage that we read it takes place the night that Jesus was arrested. This is Jesus' last supper. He's just celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples, which we'll have an opportunity to do later on. Uh, and he's taking this time before he's arrested and the next day uh, killed uh, to teach his disciples. He has a discussion with them. He, he, he's teaching them, preparing them for what's to come. And in this numerous times, he's revealing that he's going to leave them. He's going to go away. And I want us to place ourselves in the disciples' shoes for a moment. Think about who these men are. These are men who have followed Jesus for three years. Uh, they've uh, done everything with him. They left their jobs. Some of them perhaps left their families for significant periods of time in order uh, to follow, to walk with Jesus. And they, in doing that, they had heard him preach. They'd heard him teach. They'd seen him cast out demons from people. They'd seen him miraculously heal people. They'd been on stormy seas when Jesus, and Jesus had just calmed the storms. They'd seen so much from Jesus. They'd, he, he had also sent them out, uh, empowered them uh, to speak, uh, to, to preach about him, to, to heal and to cast out demons themselves. And now he says he's going. For a bit of a comparison, think about maybe your best friend or, or a time perhaps you've had where you've had to move away or, or your best friend has moved away. There's, a, there, there's some pain, there's some grief when we lose someone to, to moving uh, that, that, that we experience, maybe a mentor or a friend. That's what these disciples were experiencing right now. Their best friend, their mentor, their teacher says that he's leaving them. And as he says he's leaving them, he says some very surprising things about that. Look at verse 7. Jesus acknowledges in verse 6 that these disciples are sorrowful, and then he says, but it's to your advantage that I go away. It's good, it's actually good for you that I'm leaving. How? How can Jesus say something like this. Why is it good? Why is it better for Jesus to leave his disciples? Why is it better for us to be in a time where Jesus is not walking on this earth? Well, he follows that up in the next line by saying that, uh, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him 
to you. As we seek to understand this helper, the Holy Spirit, and why it's good that, that Jesus left and the Spirit came, I want to step back and, and look at just what the Bible is. What is the Bible and what is, what is it showing us? Well, I can quite simply say that the Bible is how God reveals himself to us. God makes himself known to us in the Bible. And he makes a, also makes a, his plan of salvation known to us. The Bible tells the story of how God is saving people, about how he's going to redeem and bring all things back to himself, how he's going to undo everything uh, that, that the fall started. And if we, we read the Bible, God reveals himself in different ways. If you think to stories in the Old Testament, God in a, a very direct way revealed himself. You can think of Noah. God directly comes to Noah, tells Noah that there's going to be a flood, and gives Noah instructions about building the ark. Or, or Abraham, in Genesis 12 through 22, we read the stories of Abraham, of Abraham's life. And over and over again, in various ways, we have God directly coming, speaking to Abraham. Or Moses, at the burning bush, the God reveals himself directly and speaks directly to Moses out of the burning bush. And then later on in the Old Testament, God raises up prophets, men that he spoke to directly uh, through words or, for, or, or through dreams and visions uh, that then brought the word of God to God's people with such authority that they could say, thus says the Lord, this is the very word of God. But then when we get to the New Testament, things change a bit. We, we, we reach a new era, an, an era that really the Old Testament was pointing forward to. Because all of a sudden, Jesus is born. Jesus is born as Emmanuel, the fulfillment of the prophecy that God would dwell with his people. And Jesus was just that. He was, was God in the flesh. He, he had come to fulfill these Old Testament prophecies. So much so that the Bible can say later on in Colossians 1 that Jesus himself is the visible image of the invisible God. And the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1 can say that God in various times had manifested, had revealed himself in different ways, but has revealed himself in Jesus. So as the New Testament starts, God reveals himself in Jesus. God come in the flesh. But now Jesus, God in the flesh, is saying that he's going away. But what he says in, in John 16 is that as he goes away, a new era will come in. An era in which this helper, the, the Holy Spirit, would be sent into the world. And this would be better for us. This would be better for the disciples. But how does this happen? Well, for one, if, if we think of Jesus, Jesus was restricted to a physical body. Uh, he was not able to be everywhere present. He, he experienced the same limitations of, of only being in one place that we experience. But the Spirit did not have that limitation. The Spirit could indwell, could, could, could live inside God's people uh, wherever they were, empowering them and, and uh, leading them allowing the gospel to break forth into new territory and spread in a way that it couldn't while Jesus was alive. We, we read of that in the book of Acts. As the Spirit is poured out, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but as the Spirit is poured out on Jesus' followers, they, they go around and, and they break down ethnic barriers. They break down uh, geographic barriers. They break down language barriers. All as the Holy Spirit fills them and enables the message of Jesus' death and resurrection to expand in a way that it never could have before. It's as if Jesus, as, as Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, a, a fuller revelation, a fuller manifestation of God's kingdom comes in. Jesus began his ministry in Mark 1, Mark 1 and in Matthew 4 by saying that the kingdom of God was at hand, and now in the sending of the Holy Spirit, that, that gets ushered in in a more full way. D.A. Carson, a, a New Testament scholar, uh, puts it helpfully. He says that before the triumphant inbreak of God's saving reign, 
Before the inauguration of the new covenant, millions ignored the claim of the true God. Pentecost transformed that limitation. And millions have been brought to happy submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and to growing obedience by the power of the Spirit whom he bequeathed. Here's the incredible thing. Here's what Carson's saying. Here's the incredible thing about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. More people are following Jesus today than followed Jesus when he was on earth. It may seem like a simple fact, but it's an incredible thing that can only take place by the Spirit. We had a, a, a wonderful opportunity Tuesday uh, an evening in our congregational meeting to, to hear uh, from a representative of, of Mintz International Seminary, uh, Norland de Groot. He uh, oversees uh, the South and Southeast Asia uh, division of, of Mintz. And he was, he was able to share with us of his work in countries like Pakistan and the Philippines and Indonesia and India, uh, among others, and just sharing stories of, of how pastors are being trained and, and going out and planting churches, how the gospel is reaching into these very dark areas of the world, very spiritually dark areas. That can only take place if the Holy Spirit was sent. That can only take place as, as Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit furthers Jesus' own uh, ministry, furthers that message of salvation. This is something that ought to excite us. The Holy Spirit's alive. He's active today. He's working in people's hearts. This is something that we'll come back to. Encourage us all to take some time and just reflect on how amazing this is. Reflect on Jesus' words in verse 7. That's actually better that Jesus is reigning in heaven now because the Holy Spirit is here and bringing many people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, furthering the work that Jesus came and started. Well, how does he do this? I want to see, secondly, that Jesus, or that the Holy Spirit applies Jesus' ministry. Jesus, the Holy Spirit applies Jesus' ministry. You're looking specifically at verses 7 through 11. I won't read it, but just have your Bibles open uh, to verses 8, 8 through 11. Rather, Jesus says something strange again. Probably sounded strange to the disciples, perhaps sounds strange to us. That when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict people. He's going to convict people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, for this point, I'm going to, going to say the main point of this point very clearly. And then we're going to see it illustrated in another passage in the Bible. The main point is this, that when Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit convicting, the Holy, what he means is that the Holy Spirit convicts in order to convert people. The Holy Spirit convicts in order to convert people. He, the Holy Spirit convicts people, and that conviction is meant to lead to repentance and to lead to people casting themselves on Jesus, placing their entire faith and trust in Jesus. And this would happen in, in, in the very lifetime of these disciples. I flip over to Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles. Acts chapter 2. We're not going to read it all, but do have it open as we'll be looking uh, at different sections of it. Acts chapter 2 is uh, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's when what Jesus says actually took place. And it starts off, Acts chapter 2 starts off with about 120 followers of Jesus in an upper room. And they're praying. And then all of a sudden, uh, a mighty wind comes and, and shakes the building they're in. They see little flames of fire on top of each other's heads. They start speaking in other known languages. And, and this causes a scene and all of a sudden all kinds of people uh, that are in Jerusalem at that time, people from all around the known world come, and they want to see what's going on. And they come and hear uh, the disciples declaring the gospel in, in their own languages even. And then Acts 2 records Peter standing up, and he preaches a sermon to them. And I want to pull out a few things uh, from this sermon to, to show how the Holy Spirit works, how the Holy Spirit convicts in order to convert. First of all, as Peter preaches about Jesus, he's very real, very direct, very blunt about sin. He calls out the crowd, uh, telling them in uh, verse 23 that they killed him, 
that they had hated him. They had delivered him over to be executed. They were guilty of Jesus' death. And then if you would look over at verse 34, or 37 rather, we see the result of this. We read that they're cut to the heart. They're convicted of what they've done. And they cry out to the apostles, what do we need to do to be saved? Just as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, but he also convicts of righteousness. Much of of Peter's sermon is showing how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies, how how Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his, his being seated at God's right hand, all of that fulfilled God's plan of redemption. And the very fact that Jesus rose, that he ascended, and that he's reigning right now at God's right hand shows that he was perfectly righteous. So that he, did, he accomplished everything that needed to be done in order to be saved. Which means on the flip side that we, Peter is saying that we don't have a righteousness that can save us. And think of the words of, of the prophet Isaiah that even our best deeds, even the best things we do are filthy rags in the sight of God. Spirit convicts us of that, but then at the same time points us to Jesus, gives us the hope that Jesus is the one who is righteous in our place and we're saved by his righteousness. And lastly, as as Peter talks after, we see that the the Spirit convinces, convicts of judgment. As as Peter speaks of uh, the accomplishment of what Jesus has done, the assumption is that everyone who is opposed to Jesus is actually allied with Satan, who experiences uh, judgment, as we saw last week from Revelation, is cast into the lake of fire. Peter also says in verse 40, he, he urges these hearers to save yourself from this crooked generation. So the Spirit convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, just as just as Jesus said, what's the result? At the beginning of Acts 2, the church is made up of 120 people gathered in an upper room. At the end of Acts 2, the church is made up of 3,000 people who came to saving faith in Jesus on that day. And as we read through the book of Acts, you, you would read that people uh, were gathered to the church daily. People were being saved daily And then the apostles and the deacons and others spread out from Jerusalem and they brought the message of of, of Jesus and salvation, uh, breaking barriers beyond Jerusalem and Judea. And then later on we read of Paul and Barnabas and then Paul and Silas who went all around the known world and and preached and taught and planted churches. And and we read of people being saved. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was applying the finished work of Jesus to people's heart, drawing people to faith, to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And it's the same spirit. We need to be convinced of this. It's the same spirit who is doing this today. The Holy Spirit's alive and active today, working in our hearts, renewing us. Even if you grew up in church, the Holy Spirit is in you, renewing your heart daily as you hear his word and, and read it and, and worship. He's bringing people into the church today as well. Do we believe this? It's a question I have to ask myself all the time. Do I actually believe that the Holy Spirit can do this? I can confess so often I'm, I'm stuck thinking about what our church can do uh, actively uh, to get people in or, or how sermons should be better constructed or whatever. And those are important things because the Spirit uses these means. We can't forget that apart from the Holy Spirit, none of this is possible. And so it's a call for us, for myself, each one of us, to be earnestly praying for the Spirit to be renewing our own hearts, for the Spirit to be renewing our own lives, applying Jesus' finished work to us over and over again so that we can be used by him to, to like the disciples, bring this good news and also pray that the Spirit would be working in our neighborhoods, among our friends and relatives and co-workers. Let's be a praying people. 
be a praying church, a church that prays eagerly and expectantly for the Spirit to be applying this work to us and to those around us. One last thing, thirdly, the, Jesus, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus' ministry. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus' ministry. This is where so much could be said. We only have a few minutes left. So we're going to have to set aside all the questions about do charismatic and miraculous gifts happen today? That can be a discussion later. But as we look at verses 12 uh, through 15 back in, in John 16, we want to see what Jesus, what, what we mean by the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus' ministry. When we look at these words, we need to understand that first of all, they apply to the disciples. The disciples were the original hearers. So we have to ask, what does it mean for the disciples? What does it mean for the original hearers? And in this case, we can, we can answer that or by asking another question, who were the disciples? Kids, can you rattle off a few names of disciples? Of these disciples that followed Jesus, do you remember any of their names? Yeah, two right there. Peter? Emma? That's what you were going to say? Yeah, Lily? John, Zach, Paul, he was later on. Yeah, that's true. We could think of, so we have Peter, John, Paul. We could think of, who else? Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, Luke, yeah, Luke was, in a sense, a follower of Jesus as well. What else do we know about these people? We're reading from John. There's a book named after Luke. There's two books named after people. Here's the point. When Jesus says that he is going to, that, that the spirit of truth will come and lead the disciples in all truth, what that means for the disciples is that they would be used by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible, to write the New Testament. Could uh, parallel look at a, a earlier in John, in chapter fourteen, verse twenty-six. Uh, Jesus says that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. And then in our chapter, in verse chapter sixteen, verse thirteen, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He'll declare all things that are to come. The Holy Spirit, through certain of these disciples, recorded what Jesus said and did. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Through Paul and others, the, the Holy Spirit inspired the epistles which uh, apply Jesus' teaching, uh, unpack it in various ways, and, and say how it applies to our lives. And in the God, book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit applied to jo or inspired John to see these visions and record about Jesus' second coming. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus' ministry by giving us the New Testament. This is why it's better for us to be alive now than in Jesus' day, because we have God's entire word. The whole Old Testament is pointing forward to who Jesus is, and the New Testament is telling us about how he accomplished God's saving work. But we're not writing the Bible today, so how does this apply to us? This came home for me a number of years ago. I was taking... Greek classes, getting ready for seminary, and really treating the Bible as a academic book that could pull apart and analyze and see how things fit together, and, and I wasn't seeing it as, as God's word. And I had a mentor uh, who I confessed this to, and he came alongside me and just said, have you thought about the Holy Spirit? And I kind of went, What? He said, have you thought about the Holy Spirit? How the Holy Spirit applies to your Bible reading, your Bible studying. And then he began to, to show me, uh, to help me understand that the Holy Spirit takes God's word. He takes the Bible. He opens our hearts. He opens our minds to be able to hear it, to see it. He enlightens us spiritually to be able to see God's plan of redemption, God's saving work in the Bible that's done as the Holy Spirit is poured out. And it's the same for us today. As we read God's word on our own, uh, individually or as a family, 
We need to seek the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to, in a sense, reveal Jesus to us. As we come to church and as we read various passages throughout the service, as we sing uh, various words from the Bible back to God or, or truths of, of Scripture and the songs that we sing, as we hear God, uh, God speak to us in his word and in, in the preaching, we need to understand that it's only by the Holy Spirit that this can be driven home into our hearts, applied to us. It seems ordinary. It seems plain. We have the sacraments this morning as well that the Holy Spirit works through as well. All these plain, tangible things. And yet the Holy Spirit takes these plain, tangible things and works a miracle with them. Because through God's word, through God's word being read, through God's word being explained, people are coming to know Jesus. People's lives are, are being radically transformed from darkness into, into spiritual light as they, they meet Jesus in his word, as the Holy Spirit opens their eyes, as, as he opens their eyes uh, in, in church services and in the preaching of his word. We have our, our faith strengthened by the Holy Spirit taking ordinary bread and ordinary wine strengthening us as we remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. Pointing us back to Jesus. And that's the wonderful thing about the Spirit. As much as Jesus may be the forgotten person of the Trinity, I don't think so. But his work is to point us to Jesus. To point us to the fact that we are sinful, broken people who serve a great and miraculous, wonderful Savior. And so I pray that as a church, we might be more aware of the Spirit's work in our own lives as individuals, amongst us as a church here. And that as we pray individually, as we pray together, as we pray in small groups, we, we, we would be praying eagerly. We'd be praying, expecting the Spirit to move, to work amongst us to work in our communities because the same spirit that Jesus promised his disciples, the same spirit that he poured out on Pentecost is a spirit that's alive and that's working and that's active today, bringing us before God and bringing people to God, to a saving faith in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in this truth. We rejoice in the fact that you are alive, you are active, you are working in us through your spirit. Please make us aware of his work. Lord, would we be able to rejoice and, and glorify you as we recognize how the spirit is working in our lives, how he is working in our city, how he is working around this world to bring people to Jesus, to help people see Jesus face to face. Lord, we pray that you would be at work in us, that you would renew each of our hearts, that you would renew us as a church, giving us such joy in the gospel that can only come through the Holy Spirit, and that you would use us then to reach into the city, into our communities, with the, the hope that the Spirit works. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.